Welcome to Black Hat USA 2010. You are in the final installment of the cloud virtualization track. Yeah. Hello, my name is Georg Wisniewski, and I'm a virus analyst with Kaspersky, the antivirus company. And today I will be talking about Dirtbox, which is a very scalable x86 and Windows emulation approach that I created because I wasn't very confident and happy with what was out there already. So what I will be presenting on today is not really, really related to my, my day job at Kaspersky, but related to my bachelor thesis I'm currently writing. So all the stuff I'm going to be disclosing today will not help you evading emulators of Kaspersky or whatever, but I'm kind of porting ideas to, to the Kaspersky job as well. But anyway, um, let's first um, find out why not just ex use, uh, use these existing solutions and, well, how this looks in general from a, a high-level point of view. So um, there's two different kinds of sandboxes out there. First, there's malware analysis sandbox uh, solutions that will just ease your job as an analyst by automatically analyzing malicious code for you. Um, I categorize a lot of them to what I call VMware rootkits, like CW sandbox, Jobox, Zbox, and, and these kind of sandboxes. Of course, they don't need to be run inside VMware. Uh, they can be run on the physical computer what they call bare metal sandboxes. But the thing here is that um, for, for ease of use and also you don't want to install physical computers all the time, most people just run them inside VMware and use the snapshot features to reset the sandboxes. So that's why I call them VMware rootkits because they're just a ring zero driver that records stuff. Um, then there's uh, the other kind of sandboxes like Norman Sandbox, for example. Norman Sandbox uses Norman's custom x86 uh, emulator. Uh, or Anubis, for example, which is actually a modification of QEMU and therefore um, has a some virtual machine um, uh, view from the outside. Uh, uh, but all, but all they have in common is that they are using uh, a full operating system like Windows inside some virtual machine, except for Norman Sandbox, uh, which really only emulates uh, user land code. So Norman Sandbox is more related to antivirus in any way either. Um, so the thing is, that doesn't really scale up because um, you can only analyze one malware sample in one real uh, Windows virtual machine at a time. And Windows virtual machines, they, well, for at least for XP, they need at least 512 megabytes to really work. So um, if you have a lot of malware samples to analyze, like for example, Shadow Server Foundation, who gets a lot of samples each day, uh, you will need a lot of physical systems to scale up your sandboxing. So Shadow Server Foundation, for example, has more than 500 physical machines running each running multiple virtual machines to scale up for the malware analysis um, and to well they're still building up some queue so um, that doesn't really scale well that's one of the drawbacks and the other one is of course detectability um, because I mean at least for the public web interfaces uh, these smell these these whole uh, system emulations they have like a computer name they have a desktop background color stuff like this so what malware developers usually do is they just add some code to check for specific computer names or whatever, and thereby evade all these analysis sandboxes very trivially. Of course, if you set up them on your own, you can change the desktop color and the virtual machine and everything like this, and then you will not be as easily detectable, but still there's very easy ways to detect it. And then again, if you are running inside VMware, there's obviously a lot of malware which does not run in virtual machines, and you will not detect that at all. <coughs> The, the other kind of uh, emulators for, for malware is malware detection emulators. They don't aim at really um, understanding what a malware sample would do in, uh, in, at all, but they're mostly uh, there for just detecting if it's malware or not. And most serious antivirus solutions these days may have one of these emulators inside. So the picture here is from a ROC AV. That's not really a serious antivirus solu um, solution. But um, the thing is that they're working on an API level emulation. So they're mostly doing software emulation. Um, the whole x86 uh, instruction set has been implemented as C++ code. So they're just interpreting the, the, uh, the code in software, which is very slow. And then um, they emulate the, the environment, the Windows environment, at API level. So as soon as there is a call to an API in kernel 32 or users 32 or whatever, their emulation code of the Windows environment kicks in. And that's very detectable. For example, what you can do is unimplemented APIs because every single API that is there in the Windows world needs to be implemented by the antivirus emulator too. Uh, you can look at the heap layout. I will show some more stuff later. So in essence, they have the drawback that they're usually slow, um, which is okay because you just want to detect malware and don't want to do complete run, but just run through some unpacking or whatever. And then, yeah, easily detectable. Um, I mean, 
people are doing this arms race thing, so uh, antivirus vendors, they, they patch the emulators. Once they see new malware samples detecting the emulators, then the malware authors again change the detection and yeah. But that's not really something, something very good, I think. So. Um, one example for, for detection is um, side, uh, side effects of APIs. So um, some of you probably know structured exception handling. What is, uh, that is, if you have a try statement, try and, and catch statement in uh, Visual Studio uh, C++, they, they all share um, common code if you do these constructs in, in C++. So the, the compiler then generates code uh, for this function, and the function epilogue, epilogue is always the same bytecode. And this epilogue uses a sequence of push ECX and then return to return to the calling uh, function. So um, that means that with this code in place, you always will have uh, some detection of the ECX register because um, the ECX register, it's by calling convention, belongs to the call function. So that means um, the, the contents of the register are undefined upon function return. Uh, and well, and real world code shouldn't care about the register value. If it, it uses the, re, uh, the register itself, then it should push it and then pop it before the API call to save the value in it. But the thing is, because there's this fixed bytecode, uh, push ECX and return, in all these SEH protected functions, it's uh, possible to predict the value in ECX register, for example. And that means you will always find the, the uh, value of the end, um, the, the address of the end of the uh, protected function inside the ECX register. So this can be predicted, this address, for example, by taking, looking at the, the code in memory and scanning for return instructions or something like this. And then you can just, uh, upon API return, compare the expected value of the ECX register with that address you, you found in memory. And if they're not the same, then you're probably um, ran, are running inside an antivirus emulator because the antivirus emulator uh, it will not execute all the bytecode that it has there in memory, but instead it will have some custom implementation of this API, and that won't, of course, set these undefined registers. So um, this breaks this simple trick, very simple trick, uh, implementation-wise, that's like my, maybe at most two hours of work, breaks a lot of uh, antivirus emulators right away and awaits detection. Um, there are some, some, if you look at different antivirus emulators, there are uh, nice ways, how oh, they try to circumvent this ways of detection, but then again, it's also trivial to, to circumvent their circumvention in a way. Um, of course, using this could be used uh, from, a, from a defense side, could be used for generic anti-emulation detection as well. So um, they're using an undefined register after an API call, um, which is suspicious behavior, but then again, compilers sometimes generate strange code, and um, actually, uh, for Kaspersky, we looked into using this for generic detection of anti-emulation um, tricks, and we had too many false positives because some strange compilers, like Boland, for example, they generate strange code that will, I mean, it will use, uh, it, it will uh, look up the values in these registers, never use them, but nevertheless access these undefined registers, so. Um, and the, the whole detection thing, though, um, relies on the simple fact that all these F uh, antivirus emulators, they don't execute the API's bytecode itself, but they have a, so to speak, in the host system and own implementation of the API. And if we can get around this limitation of not executing the API's bytecode, yeah, well, it won't be detectable by this. So what does the, the whole Dirtbox system look like? Like name Dirtbox come from a colleague of mine was saying, no, okay, you, your name for, for, your, for your product sucks, so you're doing a sandbox and there's dirt in there and yeah, now you have a Dirtbox. Well, um, the idea behind this is that instead of emulating at the, at the API call layer, uh, the emulation is at the system call layer. So um, all the native code, bytecode of the APIs is actually run, run inside the virtual CPU. Um, that means, for example, NTDLL and uh, whatever is run inside the virtual CPU. And um, in essence, all these other DLLs and API implementation DLLs, they wrap around NTDLL, which at some point will issue a system call, and that's where our emulation kicks in. So um, this means that we only need to implement system calls, which is I will talk a little bit more later, and then we've got everything covered. I mean, you can create as many DLLs um, wrapping around these system calls as you want, and new APIs and whatever, but still, in, in, at the end, either it's all happening, everything is happening inside the process itself, and then we don't need to emulate anything, and everything that would call out to the operating system goes to the system calls. So if we emulate as a system call layer, we get a lot of stuff for free, basically. And also, malware issuing system calls directly is also automatically support, supported. So if you're um, working on AV emulators and 
if they pe these people say, um, okay, this malware is issuing a system calls directly and whatever, they're usually just adding signature-based detection for it, and that's it. Um, so the general flow, as you can see here, is um, execution starts inside Dirtbox, and there's these two components, Dirtbox and libcpu. libcpu is the, the virtualization slash emulation of, of the guest code, of the malware code, and Dirtbox is the Windows kernel emulation layer. So you have inside the libcpu in the guest memory, you have your malware sample and, and tdll, for example, and all these other uh, DLLs it's using for APIs. And then you have this separation, uh, which is the, is the system call, basically, which would be the transition to ring zero in a real system, and in this case, it's a transition to Dirtbox. So we emulate the system call, and then we hand back execution after the system call back to Dirt, uh, sorry, to, to libcpu, and then we execute bytecode. So it's a uh, never-ending cycle un until we end the reach, of, uh, reach the end of the process or whatever. So the first part is libcpu. Um, I did a custom x86 virtualization slash emulation because um, there's different solutions out there, but I wasn't really happy to use them for this project, so I just wrote my own. Um, well, as, as I've said, software emulation of x86 bytecode is too slow because, I mean, it's already slow for these AV emulators that run at API level, but in this case, we're executing even more bytecode because we're executing all these DLLs too. So um, executing a lot of bytecode requires a fast solution. Um, other existing virtualization solutions like QEMO or BOSS are too powerful. They do too much because we're only interested in running hostile um, Ring 3 code. But all these existing virtualization solutions, they allow you running Ring 0 code too, right? Because they support full operating systems and we don't need that. So they have their own memory management unit. They have support for privileged instructions like ports and whatever. And we don't need all that. Um, and because we don't need this, we can cut out a lot of stuff and therefore be just more performant because we don't support it. Uh, but on the other hand, we want instruction level introspection for analysis reasons. So um, we cannot just use, uh, I don't know, VMware or whatever because we want to see every single instruction, instructions in some cases for more fine-grained analysis than just you know, recording API calls like CW Sandbox would do. So um, I did my own stuff uh, based on LDT. This is uh, pretty low-level hacking stuff, but therefore it, well, it made me gain a lot of performance boost, and yeah, I'm just going to explain it. So what you need to know first about this is um, x86 memory views. When you're talking about x86 and memory use views, people usually know that there's physical address space and virtual address space. And physical address space is really like the physical random access memory you have inside your computer, and it's are all separated into so-called pages, usually four kilobytes, sometimes four megabyte big. Uh, and then there's a mapping from the virtual address space, which is what you see as a developer or whatever, to the physical address space, which is called paging. And in, in paging, you know, you can map these different pages, these different blocks to the same physical page, for example. Um, so you can save uh, address um, memory if you're ha having the same process launched twice and stuff like this. But um, most people in, in reverse engineering are familiar with these concepts, but uh, in reality, there's not only those two, but a third um, thing, which is called the logical memory view, which is also part of the protected mode concept. And, well, logical memory view comes from segmentation. So uh, a logical memory view to virtual memory view mapping is not as fine-grained as the paging mechanisms, but, um, but it only allows you to, to map segments or uh, certain size blocks. So what you can do is you take like a, a segment and uh, say, okay, the segment starts at this virtual memory address and is that many bytes big. And that allows you to, from the virtual address space, extract blocks of a certain length. Well, why does nobody know about this? Because on the current operating system, it looks like this. They do have segmentation and they use segments, but what they do is basically for all your code and data, they create one segment which starts at address zero and is for 32-bit uh, address space, it's this, uh, four gigabytes big. So they take the whole virtual address space and they just put it into, into one uh, logical address space segment. So that's why you people usually don't see that. But what we're going to do is actually, we're going to use this feature to um, create our guest memory isolation very efficiently. So, um, yeah. Um, the, the segmentation itself on, on the operating system is implemented by uh, two tables, the global descriptor table, 
which is allocated by the operating system and shared among all processes. These are these on, on the model operating system these days. These are these general large uh, segments, and yeah, that's why nobody cares about this. And there's the local descriptor table, which is process specific, and it, because it's a privileged stuff, it has to be allocated by the operating system too. But uh, operating systems like Linux are for system calls, sysmodify LT, or Windows NT, 